Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansing. Tonight, a sliver of hope in a city under siege. Officials say there are survivors after a theater sheltering children was bombed. Plus, as violence rains down on civilians across Ukraine, <laughs> Canada reveals an emergency immigration program. Can the system handle it? And behind the scenes of the rescue mission to bring kids fighting cancer here. The families both burst into tears, tears of joy. Also tonight, bye-bye border testing. Make Canada your next trip. A breath of fresh air for some, but not everyone's convinced this is the right time. And Marketplace investigates home care, following the public money funding private care that sometimes doesn't show up. What is that like? It's good. Oh, it's upsetting. This is The National. Investigations into Russia for alleged war crimes are only in the early stages, but the accusations are mounting as cities are reduced to ruin and civilian deaths rise. <laughs> this man in Kyiv weeping over a body, wordless anguish, after a missile intercepted over the city slammed into an apartment building. The death and destruction in civilian areas continues to grow, and while it's not clear whether it's intentional or indiscriminate, it doesn't change the result. One city in particular has been the site of staggering attacks on civilians. Mariupol in the southeast of Ukraine, where nearly half a million people once lived, has been devastated by Russian attacks. The latest, the bombing of a theater sheltering civilians. Tonight, there is a sliver of hope in that story. But as Chris Brown shows us, there are few people there to help. Mariupol is in ruins. Pounded day and night by indiscriminate Russian bombing and artillery attacks, civic officials say 90% of the city has been rendered unlivable. It's a horror, she said. What for? What are we guilty of? A long line of cars brought some to relative safety, but many more remain without transportation to make the journey. Even though the word diete or children was written outside the city's historic theater, Russian bombs hit it anyway Wednesday, prompting fears of a massacre. It's still unclear how many died or were hurt, but this Ukrainian MP says the shelter underneath held. People, uh, more than uh, thousands of people who were there, it's mostly women with uh, children. They started to went out. Russia's foreign ministry spokeswoman said it's a lie that Russia bombs cities. We can facilitate if the We asked the head of the International Red Cross who's touring Ukraine about that. Russia is denying it's even hitting civilian targets when the whole world can see that they are. Uh, how, how do you address that? He didn't answer but said conditions are so bad in Mariupol that staff have pulled out. Our uh, delegation has been increasingly unable to operate at all uh, in the city, had no operational capacities anymore. In Lviv, spared the worst of the war, the Canadian-Ukrainian shipping company Meast is moving supplies daily into Ukraine, most donated by Canadians. But its owner is worried about his workers in Mariupol and other Russian-occupied areas. Unfortunately, we have almost 420 people we can't reach and we don't know what's happened with them, said Rostislav Kissel. The company's boardrooms have been converted into temporary homes for employees from eastern Ukraine who've lost theirs, such as Kira and her daughter Irina. When we um, move uh, there, uh, she um, paint um, Ukrainian uh, flag uh, with um, she loves uh, Ukraine. There is growing skepticism over the peace talks which are continuing. Several European leaders have said they doubt Russia's sincerity. And in a worrying sign, Russia is continuing to move in more troops and even drawing them from another occupation force in Georgia, thousands of kilometers away. Chris Brown, CBC News, Lviv, Ukraine. 21 people were reportedly killed in a single strike on a school and community center near Ukraine's second largest city of Kharkiv. 
The mayor of Marefa on Harki's outskirts said the strike occurred just before dawn. It's not clear whether any of the dead were civilians. In Kharkiv itself, Russian bombardment left one of the largest open-air markets in Europe engulfed in flames. Scenes like that are driving Ukrainians westward, millions fleeing the country, others staying within Ukraine in Lviv. David Common shows us how that city is meeting them with kindness and courage amid fears that they too could become a target. In western Ukraine, classrooms have become bedrooms. The new residents exhausted after terrifying escapes from devastated cities. We use the last train out, says Yulia Darun. The tracks were destroyed, so the train detoured for three days. She fled from Luhansk in the east and is now living in this school temporarily, ensuring the war doesn't further disrupt her daughter Albina's education. The classes may look empty, that's because they're happening mostly online. The regular students told now to stay home, partly to make room for the evacuees, partly because air raid sirens interrupt the school day. Sometimes students come to school and uh, uh, ask about uh, what we can do for our school, what we can do for refugees. These Ukrainians are among the two million who fled within Ukraine, sometimes just before the arrival of Russian forces. We left with our family and we need something to eat, Natalia tells us. We do not have enough money with us. We took only what we were wearing. Some of those here have been in line since yesterday, pleading for help from reception centers run exclusively by volunteers. We need more staff and we need more volunteers. Mila Zaheva is an IT manager. Now she arranges warm food for babies. This is really unbelievable that now, in 21st century, this is happening to us in the middle of Europe. And that's the only thing I can do. I cannot just sit at home and watch this news. Back in the school cafeteria, Yulia Zaharchenko is on the phone with her husband, Alexander. He's describing the attacks of the last couple of hours where he is, back home fighting near Kharkiv. I miss you so much, he tells her. Yulia and their son Andre have spent four days living in the school, but even here, no one feels entirely safe worried this could be the next target. David Coleman, CBC News in the Lviv region of Ukraine. A day after the U.S. president bluntly called Russian President Vladimir Putin a war criminal, America's top diplomat echoed that accusation. Personally, I agree. Intentionally targeting civilians is a war crime. After all the destruction of the past three weeks, I find it difficult to conclude that the Russians are doing otherwise. G7 foreign ministers, including Melanie Jolie, issued a joint statement warning that war criminals will be held accountable. The UN says it has counted more than 700 civilian casualties of the war so far and that the true number is likely far higher. Russia. Canada has deployed another warship overseas to help support NATO. HMCS Halifax will leave Nova Scotia on Saturday to the Baltic region, where Russia has two naval bases. Early last month, HMCS Montreal arrived in the Mediterranean region on a scheduled deployment. Ukrainians who want to come to Canada may now be able to get here faster thanks to a new application process, but there is concern the system could become overwhelmed as immigration officials are still dealing with another promise to Afghan refugees. Rafi Bujikanian explains. Lena Boritz and her son fled the violence in their hometown of Dnipro. Her husband stayed behind. He said he was fine, but do you think he could say something else to me? She and her seven-year-old are hoping to come to Canada. She's shielding him from the reality of war. He thinks that we are traveling. I just, just didn't want to... <clears throat> I didn't want them to pass through that trauma. She's been trying to apply for a tourist visa, but it's a process. Today, maybe some relief. Ottawa announced a fast-track program to get Ukrainians here in as quickly as two weeks. They can live and work in Canada for up to three years. 
Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada is now dealing with two crises. Last summer, the government promised to resettle 40,000 Afghan refugees. So far, about 9,000 have arrived. This is where I'm sitting and this is, this is only one bed. That's it. This is the room. Assad Ali Afghan's family is one of 40 living in small units in Pakistan since fleeing Afghanistan last fall. A former Canadian government employee still waiting as Pakistan and Canada move through red tape. So how we don't know until how long we are living here, what time will they take us? The Immigration Workers Union points out that refugees from both countries face different application processes, including more extensive security checks for those coming from Afghanistan. The union worries that there could be a bottleneck for Ukrainian applicants too. But the government says they're ready to take on both crises. Um, this is the kind of uh, thing where the, the competing crises around the world demand that we respond to both. Since January, 9,000 Ukrainians have come to Canada. Today's news will mean many more are on their way. Rafi Mujikani on CBC News, Ottawa. With casualties in Ukraine climbing today, its president took his campaign for more support to the German parliament. And like his speeches to Canada and the U.S., his message was both blunt and personal. Every year the politicians say never again. You see, these words are not worth anything. Vladimir Zelensky evoking promises made after the Holocaust as he criticized the German government for not doing enough to help. He called out Germany for its close economic ties to Russia. Many Russians who are against the war have fled across the border into neighboring Latvia, some saying they may never return. And as Barry Stewart explains, they face increasingly hostile rhetoric from Vladimir Putin. <laughs> The Grinbergs are settling in to life in Latvia. Ding, dun, ding, dun. The family took the last flight out from Moscow two and a half weeks ago. Mikhail Grinberg works for the tech company Yandex, a dream job, but in a country he doesn't want to live in anymore. For me, it's a combination of I want a better future for my family. Definitely, there's definitely that. I'm not going to deny that, of course. But also it's avoiding this feeling of disgust. The family made a choice and in the eyes of President Vladimir Putin would be considered scum. Which he now says Russia needs to be cleansed of. Those words don't bother the Grinbergs. That's not what's keeping them up at night. I think I try to move from guilt to responsibility, like to think, okay, this is what happened, what can I do, how can I help? Um, but of course, every time I... Um, Fall asleep. Um, all I can think of is about kids. Kids who died. With the EU airspace now closed to Russian planes, the way out for many is over land. In order to cross into Latvia from Russia, you have to have a visa from the Schengen area, and Latvia is no longer issuing those to Russian citizens. But other citizens are eligible which is why when CBC visited the border, it was mostly Ukrainians who were coming across, including a group of nurses who worked in Moscow, but were headed to Ukraine to help out. You never think you will go back to Russia? Russia? To Russia, no thank you, she says, that's it. For what they're doing now to our people, they're enemies for centuries. A few hundred meters away, 12-year-old Igor Semenov embraces his grandmother. She's lived in Russia for years, but will soon join the rest of the family in Spain. We have a lot of Russians in Russia, but also a lot of Ukrainians in Russia, she said. The people are outraged, but the government does what it wants. Putin may be talking about the need to purify the country, but many who don't fit the government's definition of true patriot have made the decision to leave already. Mm -hmm. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Terahova, Latvia. A Russian court has extended the detention of an American women's basketball star for another two months. Brittany Griner has been held in Moscow since February. She was detained at the airport after Russian customs officials say they found cannabis oil in her luggage. U.S. officials say she has been denied consular visits. 
The two-time Olympic gold medalist is a star center for the Phoenix Mercury of the WNBA, playing in Russia during the off-season. If convicted, she faces up to 10 years in prison. Officials in Texas say a 13-year-old was behind the wheel of a pickup truck that collided head-on with a van, killing nine people and injuring two Canadian students. The group were members of a New Mexico college golf team returning from a tournament. Investigators said a spare tire on the front of the pickup failed. It caused it to veer into the oncoming traffic. The two Canadian students are now in stable condition. The team driver of the pickup truck and an adult passenger in the truck with him were also killed in the crash. Now to COVID and more on some travel news that many people have been waiting for. As we reported last night, as of April 1st, Canada will no longer require pre-entry tests from fully vaccinated travelers. As Olivia Stefanovich reports, while some are pleased, others are hesitant as case counts elsewhere in the world surge. With the spring and summer travel season just around the corner, it's about to get easier to come to Canada. My friends, the time has finally come. Starting April 1st, fully vaccinated travelers will no longer have to show proof of a negative COVID-19 test before arriving at Canadian airports and land border crossings. Like myself, and boosted, so uh, I think it's a good thing. It would certainly make travel a lot easier, so we're excited about that. Many travelers welcome the move, but some have concerns. I feel like it can be harmful for some people who are immunocompromised especially. The mayor of one of Canada's border cities calls the change overdue. We need to find a way two years in to live with this virus. We've seen a significant decrease in the rates of positivity of travelers entering into Canada. The health minister says that rate has fallen from nearly 10 to 1 percent since the peak of the Omicron wave. It's low, but it's not trivial. And so that's the thing that makes me a little bit worried, especially as we're starting to see cases surge in China and Europe. The World Health Organization is warning of a rise in global cases, fueled by the highly contagious Omicron subvariant BA2. Canada's health minister says the government is watching. If we see that we need to adjust measures, we will obviously do that. What's not changing? Travelers still have to fill out the Arrive Can app before entering Canada and wear one of these in airports and on planes. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Ottawa. Canada now has another COVID vaccine option for children aged 6 to 11. Today, Health Canada approving Moderna's vaccine, officially called SpikeVax, for that group. Pfizer's vaccine for children aged 5 to 11 was approved last November. The pandemic exposed serious problems in long-term care homes across this country. But an investigation by our colleagues at Marketplace has found Canada's publicly funded home care system is in crisis as well. Erica Johnson explains why the support more than a million Canadians need can't always be relied on. Hi, how are you? Six years ago, Willie Foreman's husband, Robert, suffered a massive stroke. Paralyzed, he needed publicly funded home care. The Ontario government contracted Paramed, a giant private home care company, to deliver it. But care for Willie's husband of 50 years was sporadic. Sometimes no one came at all. He had to move to long-term care. There are no words, really. It was, it was horrible, you know. Marketplace heard from many others using publicly funded home care. Missed visits, their biggest complaint. So you haven't had a shower? Since the 11th. For over two weeks? Yeah. What is that like? Um, excuse me. Oh, it's upsetting. Across Canada, home care is publicly funded. Some provinces and territories deliver home care themselves. Others also contract private companies. Details of those contracts are largely secret. As soon as contracts are privatized, even though it's public money, they fall under the part of the Privacy Act that shields them from public scrutiny. She says that makes it hard to know how often home care companies miss scheduled visits, but still get paid. A recent report by Ontario's Auditor General says the province had little information because companies did not have to report how often those missed visits happen. 
A PSW we talked to explained some of those missed visits. We're not naming him because he fears losing his job. Probably once a week at least, I'll look at my schedule and it'll be overlapped or double booked. We asked Paramed for an interview. It directed us to the association representing Ontario's home care companies. But Home Care Ontario wouldn't talk either. In a statement, it said the industry has lost staff during the pandemic and home care companies need the province to provide more funding so they can give workers better wages. The Ontario government said it will be investing more. Erica Johnson, CBC News, Vancouver. You can see the full marketplace investigation into the crisis in home care tomorrow night on CBC Television, 8 p.m., 8.30 in Newfoundland. Canadian hospitals are answering the call to help Ukrainian children in need of life-saving treatments. When we informed them that uh, they were going to Canada, um, the families both burst into tears, tears of joy. Coming up, we speak to the people behind the scenes helping Ukrainian families get Canadian care. Plus... Close the airspace. Please stop the bombing. Ukraine's president pleads for help. Will it change NATO's mind? Rosie and the Ad Issue panel are here, but first. This is a historic moment, a big moment. Fresh from the assembly plant, NASA's mega rocket makes its debut. Ladies and gentlemen, the world's most powerful rocket ever, right here. NASA is one step closer to returning to the moon with its mega rocket SLS Orion. Standing taller than the Statue of Liberty, it weighs almost 2.5 million kilos. After years of meticulous planning, it's making its way slowly but surely from assembly plant to launch pad, where scientists will carry out a final round of tests. In a few short weeks, all eyes are going to be on the sky as it rocks the space coast and takes its maiden flight around the moon and then comes back. The outcome of that uncrewed mission will pave the way for future space explorations, including to establish a lunar colony and eventually go to Mars. The program will also send a Canadian to lunar orbit by 2024 and by the following year, send the first woman and the first person of color onto the moon. The European Space Agency has suspended its Mars rover mission with its Russian counterpart citing the invasion of Ukraine. The rover's primary goal was to determine whether Mars ever hosted life. It was sent, set to launch next year. It's not the first time the team faces hurdles. The mission had already been pushed back from 2020 because of the pandemic. A small community in Manitoba is hoping to help those fleeing the war in Ukraine. Local businesses are offering jobs and accommodation to displaced families. As Karen Pauls reports, the offer is there for as long as people need a safe place to stay or even longer if they decide to put down roots. This cottage community is a world away from war-torn Ukraine. People here hope it will become a refuge for Ukrainians fleeing for their lives. We have uh, some little bit of capacity in our staff housing situation that we feel we could incorporate maybe five to nine families uh, in the, in the area in the very near future. Alcorn Resort is one of the area's biggest employers. In addition to housing, there are jobs. We have opportunities uh, on the serving side. We have opportunities in the kitchen. We have housekeeping. Uh, we have opportunities in the spa and at our front desk. They're connecting with the nearby Ukrainian community to see if anyone wants to bring over family or friends. It would be nice to know some people coming here and they have you know some support too from it might just make it a little easier in the hardest time of their life. Because we're waiting for government direction. That offer is just one of nearly 800 the Ukrainian Canadian Congress received in two days after putting out the call to Manitobans. I'm just delighted to see that we as Canadians, as Manitobans, have opened our hearts, our wallets and our homes. Today's announcement by the federal government provided more details on the new emergency travel visa. But Lewandowski is still waiting for more clarity on how people will get here and whether support will be available once they arrive. A lot of them are coming with bare minimum. They just took their overnight bag and ran. 
Back in western Manitoba, this small community has already put aside $20,000 to help people relocate. We just want to help you and, and help get you in a, in a place where you can be peaceful and a place where you know you're safe. A safe haven for as long as they need it. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Onanol, Manitoba. One international organization is taking a different approach to help refugees. <laughs> Clowning around to help kids forget the war, if only for a moment. But first, Rosie's here with that issue. Thanks, Ian. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky pleaded to U.S. and Canadian politicians for help earlier this week. NATO is making plans to boost its military presence in Eastern Europe as NATO leaders get set to meet next week. What could change after that meeting? Chantal, Althea, Andrew and Elamine right here with us after this. I know that you all support Ukraine. We've been friends with you, Justin. But also, I would like you to understand, and I would like you to feel this, what we feel every day. You imagine when you, when you call your friends, your friendly nation, and you ask, please close the sky, close the airspace, please stop the bombing. That's Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky addressing Canadian Parliament as he did U.S. Congress this week, pleading for more to be done to help his country. But are NATO countries prepared to do what he's asking for? And how might this influence the NATO meeting in Brussels next week? It's Thursday. I'm here with that issue. Chantal Hebert, Andrew Coyne, Althea Raj and Elamine abdul Um Althea, I'll start with you on this, just in terms of the reaction to Zelensky addressing North American politicians directly with really clear demands. Did you get the sense that that changed anything? Unfortunately, no. Um, I think, you know, he needs to ask for a no-fly zone for his own people, even if he knows that um, the president of the United States is not going to agree and uh, Canada is not going to agree um, and most nations are not going to agree. Like, he, he still needs to put that ass there. I thought what was interesting um, is just how he kind of fine tunes his message for everyone he's speaking to, whether it's the British House of Commons or it's the US Congress or it's um, our parliament here or even uh, Germany today. Um, what, what was interesting in his US address was that he said, even if you can't give us a no-fly zone, here are other things that you could give us. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is there is still a there's still a, a roadmap for politicians to say we are acting on what he Zelensky is asking us, even though if it's it's not the primary ask. Chantal, I'm guessing a lot of people in the Crimea and Grozny and other places uh, have not enjoyed those peaceful decades uh, that Althea mentioned. Uh, mm -hmm. And yes, at first glance, uh, President Zelensky united the House of Commons against this key ask, which was a no-fly zone. But I still think that um, his speech to the House of Commons served Canada's political parties, or at least uh, the Conservatives and the Liberals well, in the sense that it may be that we will become more engaged in this conflict. Uh, and if and when we do, public opinion will need to be on side. Oh. And up to a point, what that speech did was move public opinion or keep it on side with doing more, which is useful service. Also, well, he is right. Uh, this is not someone who delivers a stump speech. And looking at all the speeches this week, the speech to Canada was a lot more friendly than the speech to the US Congress or the speech to the Germans today. So there are different targets, and they do recognize the roles that all of the players are playing. Those are those are good points. And El, I mean, you couldn't have listened to any version of that speech and not have been moved as a, sort of a regular person. So I, I wonder, to Chantal's point, does that allow for a different conversation uh, when when NATO leaders meet next week? It certainly does. Um, it certainly sort of allows for that idea of public opinion being behind more action in Ukraine. The question becomes the existential one, in a sense, which is like, what is NATO willing to do um, when it comes to stopping Vladimir Putin? Because that is existential in the sense that, okay, if not Ukraine, like if they're going to let Ukraine fall, 
then when will they stop him? Will they stop him if he goes to Moldova? Will he stop? Will they stop him if he goes to Poland? What happens? Like, what are the levels that have to happen in order for NATO to act? So, Andrew, how important is that meeting next week? Do you think? Uh, it well could well prove to be critical because events are changing by the day. So NATO has drawn this line in the sand that they won't cross themselves. Uh, we won't get into a no-fly zone, but we'll do everything short of that. And it may be the purpose of asking for the no-fly zone is not in the expectation that you'll get it, but that you'll yeah. be able to pull everybody up to at least close to that bar. Yeah. Uh, and by the force of your moral example. I mean, those these speeches that he's been making are remarkable, uh, particularly for the way in which he speaks. I've not seen a politician or a national leader speak in quite the same way, except perhaps Václav Havel in terms of the directness, the moral clarity, the simplicity, the concreteness. Uh, and it may be the nature of the situation he's in. When your back is against the wall, you get very clear about things. But it has mobilized public opinion, not just in uh, Ukraine, but around the world. And for that reason alone, people would be paying close attention. But what's also going to focus minds in NATO is uh, how does uh, Vladimir Putin respond to the essentially the failure of his campaign in uh, Ukraine? Um, we've all been worried about what would happen if he wins, and that would be a, a, present a terrible dilemma. But so does the dilemma of what happens if he loses or is losing and chooses to escalate. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Everything NATO has been doing has been trying to keep things from escalating. And every time NATO does that, he escalates. And if yeah. he really feels he's losing and he starts getting into chemical or even nuclear strikes on Ukraine, I think uh, the bars and the lines that NATO have been drawing uh, will, uh, will dissolve. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Chantal. Of course, we are not aware of what is said on back channels. And so we don't have all the facts uh, that are guiding those decisions. But one thing that matters for Canada this week uh, is that the lead on this uh, or on more proactive action has to come from Europe. It can't come from North America, not even the US. It has to come from countries that are next door to this war, where it takes only an hour to be there. Uh, and the hour by, it also applies the other way. Because otherwise, it looks like you're preaching to people who are going to be in the line of fire, uh, that they should be putting themselves in the line of fire while you sit back. And I don't think that uh, is going to bring NATO members around to more proactive actions. Uh, Althea, 30 seconds to you. One thing I thought was really interesting this week was after his speech to Parliament on Tuesday, there was a call between the prime, our Prime Minister, Prime Minister Trudeau, and Zelensky. And it didn't seem, to Chantal's point about we don't know what's going on in back channel, it didn't seem like there was a reason for that call, nor, nor did the readout offer any clear um, you know, outcomes from that call. So clearly there are discussions that they're not telling us about um, that might be trying to move the needle in a certain direction. And we don't yet know um, what what influence Justin Trudeau is trying to influence bear on Joe Biden, for example, or his European counterparts. There may be, to Chantal's point, there's, there's probably things happening that we don't yet know about. Uh, 30 seconds to you, Elamine, then I'll take a quick break. I think the idea of not knowing where Vladimir Putin's going to stop, whether he's winning or losing or how he's defining that, is a really key one because um, we have to understand that he may well turn around and say that the sanctions that the U.S. and this, the rules-based order is imposing now already constitute a war. And so if we end up in that situation, what is NATO going to do? I think what we're not hearing is what are the articulations of what are the red lines? You know, what at what point, what declaration comes from Putin constitutes a war against that order? Yeah, and, and where, when does the red line move, if ever? Okay, uh, yeah. we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, Canada's defense minister said Canada is tapped out in terms of what it can send to Ukraine. Where we go from here, at issue, back right after this. I believe that we have uh, exhausted inventory from the Canadian Armed Forces to the extent that we are able to provide uh, weapons, etc. As I said, there are capacity issues that we need to make sure we are on top of for the purposes of ensuring the Canadian Armed Forces is well resourced. 
Defense Minister Anita Anand and Power and Politics last night saying, as you heard there, Canada's tapped out in what it can continue to contribute to Ukraine militarily. And she's put a number of uh, defense proposals on the table in terms of uh, whether the budget should be increased. At issue is back, Chantal, Andrew, Althea and Elamine. I know we talked about this a little bit last week, but it, the, the story keeps shifting, I would say, or the, or the direction keeps shifting. Um, and I wonder, Andrew, OK, it's one thing to say we're going to commit to more defense spending, but do you not also have to answer the question about, you know, what that will be used for? Are we going to start having more equipment that we can send elsewhere? Is the equipment for us? Those kinds of issues. Yeah, I mean, it's clearly a part of a multilateral effort. So this is we're not just talking about the defense of Canada's shores here. We're talking about our contribution to the collective defense in the face of a clear and present danger. I mean, we have to understand we are now in a post-February 24th world. Uh, we are never going back to the status quo before then. Uh, when, when Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine, he crossed the proverbial Rubicon. And basically, we, ha we have a kind of a wild animal loose right now in the form of the Russian army. And getting them to go back inside their cages is going to be extremely difficult. And it's going to take, I think, years and decades of containment uh, to prevent another outbreak. Uh, whether or not Putin himself stays in power, I think we, we can't be assured that whoever succeeded him wouldn't be as bad or worse. So we've got a, a, a terrible problem on our hands. And one part of that is going to have to be a much stronger defense posture across NATO. And Canada is part of NATO, and Canada has to contribute to that and more than we have been to, to this date. And so, yeah, that's, you know, we're not just looking at the defense of ourselves, yeah. though it's part of it, but we are part of this larger effort. Uh, is that conversation starting, Chantal? Can, can you see us having that conversation? Because it does still seem like we're willing to do things and send it over, but not necessarily um, to, to go beyond the idea that we are not just defending our own borders. Yes, except we send troops uh, in harm's way in Yugoslavia and Afghanistan, uh, go down the list, and that's yeah. all over the um, the last few decades under liberal and conservative governments. So. No, it's not. It's actually a bit of an urban legend that we're sending guns, but we never send um, yeah. soldiers. And I'm guessing that the people who lost family in those conflicts would say, wait a minute here, uh, that is not being Canadian policy under the Liberals yeah. or under the Conservatives. I'm going to walk away from the big picture that Andrew drew, which I believe is accurate, to go to the smaller picture, which is called Canadian politics. And I believe that the Minister of Defense uh, is uh, also having uh, the pre-budget debate in public. Uh, by saying we're mm -hmm. tapped out, she is pushing her case for more defense spending and Christian Freeland's budget, which was not really on the radar, I think, two months ago. Yep. And she is also preparing public opinion to say, yeah, that is the thing to do. Uh, and I find that totally interesting because I believe those conversations should be held in public. Uh, yeah, that's that's really interesting. Althea. I think we have tended to see the Canadian Armed Forces as people we send to take care of disasters and people who go to long-term care homes um, when the province doesn't seem to be able to manage the case. And our... Our Navy is really like a glorified Coast Guard, and we don't think of the risks here in North America and in Canada. So we have neglected our responsibilities to, for example, update um, the Northern Warning System, which we should have done decades ago. Um, but now we're also being called to play our part. We can't always be takers. I should, I should point out, to be fair, that there are hundreds of soldiers stationed in Latvia and thousands yeah. more on standby to go if needed, just, just to not suggest that we don't have any sort of presence there. Elamine. Mm -hmm. I guess uh, I would say that the big conversation about world politics and the little conversation about Canadian politics are one and the same, in the sense that we are now in a moment where we have to re-articulate what a Canadian foreign policy paradigm is. It's been a long time since we've had to do that. I think we've sort of coasted on the idea of our own self-identity as a middle power without having to define what that means. And I think we're pretty good at the diplomatic stuff. And I think we sort of have to reinvigorate our own understanding of what other arenas we can play um, in the world, because frankly, it's been quite some time since our defense spending has been significant. Um, and so if we're going to return to claiming that status, mm -hmm. it will have to come with, you know, putting our money where that mouth is. Uh, quickly, Chantal, then quickly, Andrew, and then I got to go. 
but it's interesting that we would be having that conversation about doing our share at a time when the U.S. Uh, and the Americans are having a debate over uh, going back to being isolationist mm. uh, and looking out for themselves first. So we'll see where that all takes us. Andrew, like 20 seconds. Well, remember before all this, when Donald Trump was the president, we were talking about how it's a different world, even for that matter. We're not going to be able to rely necessarily on on uh, Big Brother America to always be looking out for us. So even before the, 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 the Russia thing came along, we were having to, th to have a conversation about uh, standing up for ourselves more, being more responsible for our own security. So this just adds to that. Okay, got to leave it there. Thank you all for that smart conversation. Appreciate it very much. And with that, I'll send things back to Ian, and he's in Vancouver. Thanks, Rosie. After the break, Canadian hospitals offer to help Ukrainian children with cancer. Most of the, these kids are in a life-threatening situation. We'll hear from the man working to get them here next. A delicate rescue mission from Ukraine has ended safely in Canada. Two pediatric cancer patients are now in Toronto being treated at Sick Kids Hospital. Katie Nicholson brings us exclusive behind the scenes details from the team that pulled it off. Jason Brisebois pours over logistics from his base of operations in Krakow. We were bounced around between three different airports and five different air carriers to get this, uh, to make this a reality. Brisebois is part of a complicated operation to get children sick with cancer safely out of Ukraine and into Canadian hospitals. Yesterday, after 10 days of careful planning, this flight left Poland and delivered two patients and their families to Toronto. And when we informed them that uh, they were going to Canada, um, the families both burst into tears, tears of joy, uh, that they were going someplace that uh, they knew was safe. The Russian invasion of Ukraine put a stop to life-saving treatment for hundreds of cancer patients, including children. Most of the, these kids are uh, in a life-threatening situation and uh, any kind of delay, delay of the treatment uh, is very bad for them. Making matters worse, the World Health Organization says Russia has attacked 43 healthcare facilities since the start of the war, including this cancer clinic. Even though they've only managed to move two patients so far, organizers are thrilled. We're proving that it can be done, and we're establishing a, a pathway and a process. A process they hope to streamline as more Canadian hospitals step forward to welcome more patients to get the treatment they can no longer get at home. Being safe is a, is a concept that we take for granted in, in the West, and you're never more aware of that than when you stare into the eyes of a child who's had to leave a war zone like that um, with, nothing, with nothing and very little hope for the future. And with that... I'm good. Uh, what's the latest on your end? He's off to arrange a more hopeful future for more children. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. Next, another group of medics helping kids displaced by war in a unique way. Clowning around to overcome trauma. Next. This is Slinky the Clown, not just any birthday clown, but one bringing much needed laughter. Slinky's part of the Dream Doctors Project, an international organization that helps kids in hospitals and disaster zones. Their effort to bring a moment of joy to a difficult situation is our moment. I have to say, this nose, this red nose, is a superpower. When a human being comes into a room and he sees somebody with a red nose, it immediately creates a bubble, like a space where you can live a normal life. So this is why I love this nose, because clowning, it's a therapeutical tool. We were playing with this boy, and then uh, the father said, listen, you need to be careful, because he's a boxing champion. And Buzz, who was the clown with me, was like, whoa. 
You're a champion. That's amazing. Let's give him a medal. And we did this like medal ceremony and we put on him. It was like, you're so tough and amazing. And then the father started to cry. And we asked, what's wrong? And he said, we had to leave all his medals behind at home. And now you're giving him a medal. Uh, thank you. And that's not right because kids don't need to be at war. Kids need to be kids and they need to laugh. So that's why this is so amazing because the clown speaks in the language of emotion and feeling. And everybody can connect to that. That is so amazing and uplifting. One of the parents was crying because she hadn't seen her kids express so much joy since the invasion had happened. Um, by the way, we asked Mike, our camera operator, to find me a clown nose for the show. This is the best he could come up with. It's actually, it's pretty good. It's a windsock from the, I'm not gonna do it. That is The National for March 17th. Good night. <laughs>